Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences conversation series. My name is Nazem Chichek, and I'm the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty. And today is our last conversation series event before we break for the summer. The title of today's seminar is The Buzz About Bees. What is bugging our honeybees and native bees, and what can we do about it? But before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba is located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So again, welcome to our faculty conversation. It's a virtual seminar series highlighting some of the innovative research that's happening in our faculty, and we hope to do this in an engaging discussion format. So if you missed our previous seminars, there's an opportunity to view them right here on our faculty's YouTube channel. And as another option, you can also find links to the seminars at our knowledge translation portal called the Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange, or MAKE. And makemanitoba.ca highlights some of our faculty's research as it relates to consumers and producers with links to resources such as podcasts, uh, infographics, fact sheets, and even some recipes. So today we have three speakers who will share with us a short summary of their perspectives on bees and then engage together in a conversation. So you as a viewer can participate in this conversation by sending in your questions and comments by the chat platform Slido. So right now, I'd like to call on Crystal Jorgensen, the faculty's communication specialist, to provide some guidance on how the audience can participate uh, in today's presentation. Crystal? Thanks, Nazem. And welcome everyone who's joined us today. Uh, we hope that you'll help us out with some questions for our speakers. To do that, uh, I recommend maybe just opening another browser window or use your phone and visit slido.com. Uh, enter the event code hashtag BBuzz. You'll see it crawling across the bottom of the screen there. Um, and feel free to start asking your questions at any time. And we'll we'll get to them in the Q&A portion. We'll work our way through them in chronological order at that point. Um, the question field is a little bit limited in character count, so try to keep your questions succinct. And to kick it off, we'd love to hear where people are tuning in from today. Um, so with that, I'll kick it back to you, Nazem, and we can revisit the instructions a little later. Hey, thanks, Crystal. So today's topic will delve into the world of pollinators. And as you have heard in media reports, uh, bee declines have been reported right across the globe. So this is concerning as bees are important pollinators of agricultural crops and native plants. And bees in Manitoba face numerous threats that need to be addressed. But fortunately, there are ways to reduce harm to pollinators and support both managed and wild species. So today we will hear from two of our academics who work in the area of honeybees and native bees, and a special guest who in addition to running a very successful apiary, has a passion for sustainability and outreach. So they will share the challenges facing pollinator health and also discuss some potential solutions to this really critical issue. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's guests. So please welcome Rob Curry who is a professor and the head of the Department of Entomology at the University of Manitoba. Rob has taught courses in a wide range of areas at the diploma, degree, and graduate level that includes subjects such as beekeeping, pollination biology, insect pest management, insect physiology, and general insect biology and behavior. Rob's current research focuses primarily on bee health with a focus on stressors that affect colony loss in the European honeybee. He also contributes to Be Better Manitoba, which promotes the health of all insect pollinators. So over to you, Rob. Thanks, uh, Nazem. It's uh, great to be here with you, as well as uh, Jason and Ian, who are going to hear from later on. I, uh, I think it's especially appropriate because this is National Pollinator Week, and uh, you know it's it's kind of a perfect topic. And I think insects are really, really important uh, as insect pollinators. And, and many, many species of insects contribute, but the, the ones we're focusing on today are, are bees. And I did have some uh, slides of bees that I was gonna show just so people 
people could uh, ground themselves. A lot of people, when they think of bees, think of uh, the bumblebee, which is that big fat sort of bee running around inside your yard. Uh, the bees that I focus on primarily, uh, especially since Jason uh, joined the department, is the European honeybee, which is a, a managed species. But there are just a huge diversity of, of other uh, native species that are out there that Jason will probably uh, tell you about. <coughs> Um, my sort of research area, I guess, is kind of related uh, primarily in recent years to uh, factors that are affecting the health uh, and welfare of the European honeybee. Uh, this is a managed species. Uh, it's uh, present here in Manitoba across the country, uh, managed in commercial apiaries and by hobbyists uh, in Manitoba and throughout the prairies. Uh, the primary use of this particular species of bees is to produce honey. And uh, in fact, the Canadian prairies are uh, one of the top honey producing areas in the world. Uh, the uh, amount of honey that's uh, produced in Canada is around uh, 41 uh, thousand metric tons and uh, approximately 75% of that is uh, produced in the three prairie provinces. The typical yields of honeybee colonies in the province are uh, higher than, than uh, pretty much uh, in those three prairie provinces are pretty much higher than almost anywhere in the world. And in Manitoba, it's not uncommon to have a, a provincial average of 160 to 170 pounds per hive with individual producers uh, making a lot more than that. <clears throat> so the, the Bee is really important here in Manitoba for honey production and contributes a lot to our economy, but it also uh, provides a lot of pollination services, primarily free pollination services, because in Manitoba there aren't too many uh, horticultural crops where producers charge for pollination. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, what is the problem? And the problem is that uh, really uh, for the last uh, 30 years that I've been in my career, uh, there's been one uh, particular parasite that has been a large part of the problem. It's a varroa mite. It's, it's a very large uh, mite, which is uh, not unlike a wood tick. It's uh, the equivalent to having a wood tick the size of a dinner plate on your body. Uh, when it feeds on bees, it causes a lot of problems. Uh, there are associated stressors that interact with this mite. <clears throat> And those are quite numerous. And uh, we can think of uh, pesticides applied by beekeepers, pesticides applied in the environment, uh, nutrition, the terrible weather that we've had this year, either in the fall, uh, in the last summer, or going into the year. So nutrition is really uh, critical uh, to them. Uh, the climate itself is very critical to them. And when all these stressors interact, uh, it causes all kinds of uh, problems for them. And that's when we have uh, high levels of mortality. So a lot of my research is really uh, targeted at trying to figure out what it is that's affecting bees, uh, how do we manage that, and uh, hopefully uh, come up with some solutions to it. Uh, we do traditional diagnostics that you know have always been done, uh, where we can kind of look at colonies and quantify some of the, the symptoms that we see in there visually. Uh, we're looking at molecular detection, uh, quantifying the levels of pathogens like uh, many of the honeybee viruses using uh, quantitative PCR. Uh, we're looking at uh, developing biomarkers uh, in collaboration with uh, Genome Canada, people at uh, York University and at UBC and Agriculture Canada and other groups within Canada are all sort of collaborating, trying to come up with uh, biomarkers so we can determine exactly what it is that's causing the problem. Producers now have colonies that die and they don't always know what the exact reason for that is. <clears throat> So by coming up with molecular and proteomic markers and looking at the gut microbiome, we're hoping to be able to come up with diagnostic tools that will allow a beekeeper to actually figure out what it was that caused their colony loss or what it is that didn't call their, cause their colony loss so they can say, okay, I'm not going to worry about that. Here's what I got to focus on and this is what I have to manage and, and correct in order to uh, help resolve the problem. So the development of that, that um, biomarker thing is related to a, a project called BCSI, uh, crime scene in, in investigation. It's not a crime, but maybe it is a crime that the bees are dying. Uh, and we're, we're trying to come up with a good diagnostic tool so we can actually say, okay, this is what it was that, that killed your, your colony. Uh, what we're trying to do about it, once we get all that information, we're trying to um, do breeding of bees. We're trying to uh, create locally adapted stock that's uh, really uh, well suited to our conditions, that has resistance to some of these uh, pests and parasites that we find inside the hives. Uh, we're using uh, marker assisted selection as well as traditional selection and developing techniques for that uh, to uh, 
hopefully facilitate the uh, the ability of beekeepers to create stock that is well adapted for their own local conditions and also uh, resistance to disease. Uh, and we're looking at uh, a variety of innovative ways of controlling uh, the parasites and pathogens inside the colonies, uh, looking at technologies like RNAi for controlling viruses, um, looking at uh, the use of organic acids, for example, to uh, control viral mites in a more efficient way, and, and looking at things like uh, manipulating ventilation inside uh, the winter storage buildings in order to control varroa. So I think I'll stop at that point. I know we're supposed to keep this super short, so uh, I haven't had a, my eye on the clock, but uh, I think I'll pass it on uh, back to Nazem. Thanks, Ron. That's fascinating stuff, and uh, I'm sure we'll discuss some more details later. So next up, we welcome Jason Gibbs, who's an associate professor in the Department of Entomology. Jason received his PhD at York University, studying the taxonomy of sweat bees. He has published widely on topics related to bee taxonomy, evolution, ecology, behavior, and conservation. And Jason teaches insect taxonomy and crop protection entomology and is an instructor at the annual bee course run by the American Museum of Natural History. Jason has described more than 80 new species of bees, and I understand has four named after him. So go ahead, Jason. Thanks, Nazem. Uh, yeah, um, my, my specialty is really in, in the wild bees. And um, as Rob alluded to, most people are sort of familiar with honeybees and bumblebees. They're fairly obvious. Um, but they actually represent a fairly small proportion of the total uh, bee diversity that we have in the world. Um, there's over 20,000 species of bees. So that's more than all the birds and mammals put together. Um, and only nine of those, approximately, depending on who you ask, uh, would be honeybees. And about and, uh, and maybe 250 species are bumblebees. So the vast majority of bees in the world are not honeybees and not bumblebees. And in fact, they're quite different. Um, yeah, a honeybee is kind of like, you know, if you were asked what, you know, to give an example of a mammal, it would be like picking a blue whale. They're very weird. Uh, they're amazing, amazing creatures, but most bees are nothing like that. Uh, a very typical bee would be solitary. They don't have colonies at all. There's no queens or workers. It's just a single female. She builds a nest all on her own. Uh, maybe 70% of those nest in the ground. Uh, so you might mistake them for like an ant's nest. This just has very little activity. It's just a little hole in the ground. You probably wouldn't see them at all. Um, almost everyone here who has any sort of patch of grass or, or lawn has bees nesting in it. They just don't notice it. Um, most of them are completely uninterested in humans, and so they don't sting um, because, you know, mammals are like bears and raccoons are, and humans are not natural enemies uh, of them. They, you know, they're only attacked by other insects and things like that. Um, so they'll they'll completely ignore you, uh, and you'll most, most of us go through our entire lives without noticing them at all. In fact, you know, I grew up, uh, my father was a commercial beekeeper in Ontario, um, and so I spent my entire life around bees, but I had no concept of what the diversity of bees was really like until I started in academia and started working on sweat bees. Uh, so a lot of my research is sort of really focused in on trying to understand uh, the diversity of bees and trying to understand their relationships and, and, and some of the behaviors that some of these have. Um, and so, uh, and also just kind of setting the baseline sort of information for trying to understand, you know, what conservation problems there are. Uh, one of the big issues that we have with wild bees is that we, we are just scratching the surface of what the diversity that we actually have is like. Uh, so it's very hard to sort of assess what the status and, uh, of these bees are and how they've changed over time and what stressors are affecting them because we don't really know what we have to begin with. So that's sort of the first kind of phase of what I do. Um, but then I'm also sort of interested in, in trying to understand some of these sort of ecological processes. And so, you know, I, I collaborate with, uh, with Ian, who you'll hear from in a bit, on a project that's you know, with the Organic Science Cluster that's trying to establish uh, pollinator habitat on farms in Manitoba to try to help, you know, see what sort of effect that can have on sort of promoting bee diversity in sort of agricultural systems. And so we're, my, my lab is really a sort of kind of diverse and sort of interested in sort of broad questions associated with bee diversity and, and uh, what species there are, you know, in Manitoba and around the world. Uh, and what sort of factors uh, affect them and how we can sort of promote bee health uh, in, in a sort of a broad sense. 
And, and that's it for me for now. Okay, thanks, Jason. That's amazing info. I didn't know that that, that many species, and only nine of them are honeybees. That's uh, just you know when you think about bees, you think about honey, right? And it's uh, you know just a very, very small portion of that. Uh, so that's that's very interesting. I, I think we'll come back to that later on. But next, uh, I'd like to welcome Ian Stepler, who farms with his family on a third generation farm near Miami in Manitoba, where together they crop 3,500 acres of land, calf five to six hundred head of purebred Charolais cattle and manage a 12 to 1500 hive apiary. So since Ian bought his first four hives 23 years ago, he has dedicated his life passion towards beekeeping and credits the current standing of his apiary to others on whom he has leaned on over the years. And you may know Ian from his popular YouTube channel uh, where he provides a perspective of a beekeeper who also farms. And Ian believes Beekeepers are the bridge between agricultural development and the natural world, and that they rely on uh, agriculture for their honey crop. But beekeepers also rely on the natural world to keep their colonies fed. So with toes in both, maybe yin and uh, beekeepers generally can bring both sides a little bit closer. So take it away, Ian. Thanks, Nazem. I was trying to figure out how I was going to provide an introduction here, and I didn't know what I was going to say, so I thought maybe what I'd do was just to provide you with a perspective and maybe condense one of my presentations down from an hour down to five minutes. So I'm just gonna run through pretty much what I believe and what I'm all about and what I talk about all across North America and the interaction between honeybees and uh, agricultural development. Um, our farm uh, was awarded with the Pemba Valley Conservation District Award back in 2018 and uh, we're very conser conservation minded, but they awarded us this, uh, this um, distinction more so because of our perspective into another part of conservation, which is uh, preservation of biodiversity. And the reason why we have a perspective like this, unlike maybe other farmers within the area, is because we're directly tied to not only agriculture and the conservation practices of agriculture through the grain farm and the cattle farm, but the honeybees force us to uh, appreciate all aspects of the natural world because we rely on the environment to be able to uh, grow and develop out our colonies. Uh, one of the things I'll be talking about and which I think is one of the fundamental problems with the beekeeping industry right now is just the changes within the industry and within the environment, which is providing a lack of nutrition for our honeybees and not only honeybees, but uh, native pollinators also. Honeybees require um, a, a, like a protein diet. They get that from pollen, that pollen and nectar. And it's, uh, pollen is like a superfood and they derive all their nutrients to be able to develop out their bodies and create brood and develop out their nests. And every pollen within the countryside uh, represents a different uh, amino acid profile. And it all comes together to build, to balance out their diet and allow them to move forward. And it's kind of like you're looking across your lawn full of dandelions and you see this tremendous field of flowers, which is a glut of a dandelion, which is a glut of protein, but uh, not as nutritious as it could be. So what the bees do is they mix it off with other pollens, like kind of like apples, let's say, and they mix it all together. And the way I kind of think about it is when I go up to the buffet, I load my plate full of steak and potatoes, right? But my wife's there, she's putting the greens and the vegetables and the, the fruits on the plate just to balance out my diet. And Mother Nature does much the same thing for the honeybees all the way through the spring. She's providing all these different floral uh, sources for the bees to be able to balance out their diet. They come out of winter and they develop them themselves out of the poplar and the willow, wild plums. And they go into spring, the dandelions, and they're mixing it off with all these fruits and pears to give them a balanced diet as the bees progress and develop. And the beekeepers use this. We use all this resource at hand to grow our colonies out to be able to then step into the summer months where we have agricultural flowers provide us with this bounty of nectar coming, which we then use to um, capitalize on to you know maintain our livings as we, as we produce honey and sell it. And this is a transition focused from the growth and the development from the natural world into honey production from agriculture. And that balance between the two is very important for beekeepers to be able to grow and develop our colonies and then be able to capitalize on agriculture and be able to maintain our livelihoods. So if you just look at some stats, this is my operation itself. If you make some assumptions, 
that 550 bees, you know, gather about a pound of honey from 2 million flowers. And don't check my math on this, but let's say a 1500 hive operation uses 150 million bees throughout the season to collect nearly 300,000 pounds of honey from 570 billion flowers. So that's just the footprint of my own operation. And if you look at the entire Manitoba uh, beekeeping industry, what it represents to the Manitoba economy, uh, we're looking at like an increased value of crop production to about 100, and, 100 million to $125 million directly into farmers' pockets because we're able to provide just an increase of value to their crops through the source of pollination. So we represent a very important part of the agricultural industry. Just as things are moving here, agriculture is changing on us. There's a lot of research and, and investment in technology available is allowing farmers to do a lot better job than they ever have before. And it's changed the landscape. And I'll say, like we use all these technologies in our farm also. And I, won't, I won't say the GM technology or Roundup Ready technology is killing the bees. I'd say more so it's the GM and the Roundup Ready technology is stripping the landscape of this diversity in a sense, uh, you know, eliminating all that diversity, all that food for my bees. And my brother calls them weeds, but for me, I call it bee food. It's very important. And with this technology at a farmer's fingertips, in a sense, we're kind of managing that natural sense of the world out of the production equation. Farmers are very effectively being able to do this with all the tools available to us. And that loss of biodiversity, I feel, that is negatively affecting our bees because we're unable to properly nourish our bees as we once were before. And just like any other sick animal, you look at a cow, you can tell that's a sickly animal just by the way it looks, right? That's not the way our cows look, but maybe let's say our neighbor's cow is looking a little sickly like that. The same thing with bees, just we can't see a sickly bee or malnourished bee the same way as we can the cow, but it equates to the same thing. Uh, malnourishment leads to sickness as, it's, as they can't, you know, um, if, if, just because they can't interact with all these stresses, you got parasites and pesticides and fungal infection and weather and winter and all these things being induced onto them. But I'm the farmer on that seat of the combine. I'm looking down into my grain tank saying the same thing every other farmer is saying is that we got to do a better job farming. We got to get more money in here. We got to pay our bills. We have to more effectively farm our lands. And it puts me in a very awkward position as a beekeeper who wants that diversity across the landscape, but I need to be able to manage their crops if, if effectively. So what we do in our farm is we we look around the edges, I guess. We uh, incorporate a whole bunch of different practices. We preserve the natural landscape, you know, land that we can't necessarily farm. We hold aside and that's very valuable to the bees. We preserve the wetlands, you know, water, the water, the sense of water is very important for any living animal. Uh, through our pastures, we provide flower and growth, just not necessarily for the uh, honey crop, but more so to keep our bees well nourished throughout the year. We have a grid of crown land right across the entire farm in their ditches, and we don't let the arms spray them. We manage our noxious weeds ourselves, but we allow all that natural growth to grow and provide uh, nourishment for our bees. And also, like Jason said, I participate in the a U of M pollinator strip study where we provide flowers throughout the landscape and provide some of that nourishment in places where maybe we're lacking. And I'm doing this in other places, the other in the study, I'm finding places and pockets all over the farm where I can just simply grow flowers to feed my bees. And my main objective at the end of the year, if I'm doing my job properly as a farmer, providing that biodiversity, is so I have full boxes of bees and I'm making a lot of money. And at the same time, I'm also preserving that natural aspect, which preserves the natural pollinators all at the same time. So that is just a real information drop of what I speak about. And uh, it's just what I believe in as a perspective I like to share with you. Cian, uh, thank you very much for that. It really was very informative and, and put things in perspective. So what we want to do now is uh, have a conversation uh, amongst the four of us. Uh, to start things off. In the meantime, feel free to uh, drop in your question into the uh, Slido chat box and we'll, we'll field them as they come along. But I wanted to start by, uh, you know, we have Rob Curry, our bee detective, it looks like, uh, looking after making sure he can uh, find out what's wrong with uh, uh, our colonies and why we have, um, you know, colony collapse and, um, you know, uh, the situation we face ourselves in. And he mentioned mites, Ian mentioned quite a bit nutrition and the balance. So I wanted to uh, open that up a little further. 
if you had to uh, point at a certain stressor that's responsible for the current situation we face ourselves, uh, what would you put it at? Maybe start with Rob first, then Ian and Jason. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, an excellent question, uh, Nazem, and it's also a really difficult question to answer. Um, I kind of feel like the number one uh, criminal in, in the, the honeybee world is the varroa mite, and that uh, it causes all kinds of uh, knock-on effects in terms of other diseases, pathogens, stressors. Uh, and, you know, if it was missing, I think uh, the bees might be able to handle a lot of those other stressors. But uh, when you have that mite in combination with other uh, things added on, like nutrition, poor nutrition, uh, any of the other pathogens, maybe uh, some environmentally applied pesticides that make the bees slightly more susceptible, uh, and you have all those things all together it's kind of like the straw that, that broke the the camel's back and I, I think if you could eliminate the mite from the equation you wouldn't necessarily eliminate the problem but i think it would uh, greatly improve our ability to uh, manage bees successfully we, you know even before the mite uh, I, I am that old i started beekeeping before uh, varroa was around uh, we occasionally had poor, uh, you know, colony survival and had the odd disaster, but uh, certainly nothing like uh, we've had since uh, the mite came on to the scene in Canada, which was right about when I started my position at the university in 1990. So uh, I'd, I'd probably identify the mite, but say that it's not the only cause of, of our problems. There's a, kind of a, a, just a multiple stressor effect that uh, is really causing the entire issue. And, and you can't always pin it down to one thing for all producers. Uh, one producer might have a mite problem, another might have a nutrition problem, another might have a feed problem. So it can be quite varied. And the, you know, the environment is something we can't control, but it definitely kicks us in the head every once in a while. Yeah, no, I could see that. And, you know, you, you talked about, uh, Ian talked about the balance of, of diet for the bee and and I would imagine, you know, the current weather conditions we find ourselves in, the climate variability, temperature, moisture, would have something to do with that as well. But I let Ian get to that. I think, uh, so, I mean, a healthy population is probably a more resilient one against mites and other diseases. So, Ian, do you think it is a nutrition on your end that, that is the driver for a, a healthy colony or a, a lack of nutrition would be the driver for collapse? Or do you, uh, do you uh, have a different opinion? No, I completely agree with Rob. Uh, the varroa mite is the number one leading cause to uh, the problems we're having within our industry right now, just because there's so many compounding f compounding factors that just all stem from the varroa mite. It's, it's quite the thing. It's turned our industry on its head. But if you look at the industry right now and the situation we are in right now in Manitoba, I was just speaking to uh, Rob or uh, to Rail Laffinger, the, the provincial apiarist, and he's just finished his um, uh, colony loss survey amongst beekeepers across Manitoba. And we're nearly 60% loss right across Manitoba right now. The highest loss in Canada by at least 5%. And I'd say the reason we're seeing such heavy loss right now is true to the varroa mite, but also to uh, the weather that we've experienced over the last year. It all started with last year's drought. Last year's drought was very hot and it was dry. And I don't know if you remember the smoke, but I remember the smoke. You could hardly see half a mile some days of visibility through July. And it's just a very stressful environment for bees to, uh, you know, develop through. And it led to a very stressed environment. And I think the plants maybe reacted the same way and did, didn't provide the nutrition maybe as it typically would to the honeybees and even if the honeybees were collecting it, but I think the honeybees went into a state of malnourishment as they, they transitioned out of summer into winter as they try to set themselves up to winter. And then climate set these bees on its head again as we experience a very long and drawn out, unusually flowery fall. I don't know if you drove across the countryside in Manitoba through October, but we had fields of canola in full bloom and it was a real it was kind of a tease to beekeepers because we had more flowers in October and we actually did in July because of the drought Then beekeepers just shaking our head and all this, all these flowers coming in in the warmth, it uh, reignited these nests and they actually started transitioning out of that winter nest back into almost into a summertime nest and they started brooding up again. And that varroa mite Rob was talking about then started to establish itself again and in, in hiding away from our treatments. And then we followed with a really cold 
and windy, uh, windy and a snowy winter, which was really hard, but that was, that's not unusual, except for the spring that followed was extremely unusual. It almost didn't seem like we left winter till May. It's absolutely incredible. You know, we had four Colorado lows follow through. We had flooding events. We had, it was just, and it, it created an environment for other pest problems to uh, express itself like nosema, like a gut infection, which is another uh, huge strike against the honeybee. So I think just all these factors, malnutrition, the varroa mite, uh, viruses, the, the weather, uh, gut fungal infection, all these things come together and it just decimated the hives within Manitoba and beekeepers are seeing the uh, the brunt of it this year. It's almost like... Uh, the beekeeper got kicked and is down on the ground and then mother nature come and just give him another hoof to the gut again just to finish him off so it's it's been a really tough spring for beekeepers like a perfect storm and not in the way you like that's for sure um jason if i can pass it on to you as, when it comes to native bees is is it the same situation with uh between native bees and honeybees or is the different stressors there it's actually pretty different um the varroa mite only affects honeybees um so like the primary number one sort of driver uh, has no effect whatsoever on our native bees. Uh, there are about 380 species um, in Manitoba. Um, and as I said, most of them are quite different from honeybees. Um, and for them, I, I would put, you know, just changes in the landscape as the most important uh, driver. Some bees uh, don't have the same sort of nutritional requirements that Ian sort of pointed out. Some bees are actually specialists. So they'll, they'll only visit willows or they'll only visit sunflowers. Uh, and so their you know, livelihood is very dependent on that diversity in the landscape occurring. Um, but if there are, 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 if there are no sunflowers, then there are no sunflower bees. If there's no willows, there's no willow bees. Um, and so we need that diversity in the landscape to maintain them. Um, and some of them have other sort of environmental sort of habitat preferences. So if you go an hour east of Winnipeg, the bee community will be very different from an hour west of Winnipeg. Uh, just the landscape changes, the habitats change, and the bee communities change with it. Um, so anytime we have this sort of big landscape conversion, like a canola field, we lose just swaths of different bee species. And so it's really important to have those sorts of uh, areas of the landscape like Ian is sort of conserving to maintain that diversity of plants so that all these different species have a place with it. I, can I ask a question, Nazem? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was really curious, Jason, about how this really cold spring has affected the emergence of the native bees and if it's caused a sort of asynchrony with the host plants. Yeah, that's a really interesting question and I'm not sure we'll know that yet. Um, I have a I have a, a mountain ash tree that blooms in my yard, and every year there's lots of solitary mining bees that visit it. And this year they were still there; they were still present. Although it's been I've seen very few bumblebees or honeybees in my yard. We're normally they're they're all over the place. I have a lot of early blooming flowers in my yard, and I, I saw hardly any in the first few weeks of, of the spring. Um, I was part of a study in Michigan. We had a very weird. Um, spring um, back in 2012 where there was this sort of sudden warm-up in february everything bloomed about a month early and then it we had a hard fruit for a few weeks and there was this like um uh, so all the apple blossoms all the cherry blossoms all the blueberry blossoms basically died and it seemed like there was a lasting effect from that um, i was working on blueberries you know years after that and only maybe four years after that strange spring did certain species start to come back into the, into the community? So I think some of those spring bees are really hammered um, by these sort of weird weather effects. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see something similar this year. Yeah, and you know, I mean, weather certainly we can't control. Climate is difficult to control over time. But uh, I think through the discussion, you can clearly see that monoculture or how we do agriculture, how we manage landscapes can have an effect and in many ways uh, can at least support our pollinators uh, to, to be more resilient, to, to be able to withstand attack, right? So on that basis, I, I guess one of the things that we should probably uh, go a bit deeper in, what is practices we can do, even if you're not a farmer and you're just managing your own uh, little plot in the backyard or you, you, you know, you're a hobby farmer, maybe you have uh, access to land, 
what can be done uh, for a healthy environment for pollinators and bees? So maybe we'll start with Ian first and then uh, go to Rob uh, next. Well, I'm a big believer in little efforts, you know, all, a lot of little efforts together makes for a big outcome. And I you know it sounds kind of silly, but it's very true. It's, it's kind of what we practice on our farm. Like our farm, we need to focus on production. We need to manage the land because we have obligations. You know, I could be preaching about all these things and I go broke and then, then what, you know, so, and society needs us to produce because we need to feed ourselves right it's very important we're food producers we need to be able to produce our this food for us to be able to survive so we need these efficiencies we need these technologies but it doesn't mean that we can't focus on little things that contribute to what we're lacking like uh, so if, if we're going to be farming our fields what about the edges like the ditches there's a place where maybe we could grow some flowers for the bees or through the pastures. So what I do in the pastures is I grow like this grass, we grow the grass for the cattle, but I also sprinkle in just a little bit of clover. Uh, clover is just an amazing flower. It's just very nutritious pollen and very, very high yielding nectar. And what we do is we grow just a sprinkling of clover throughout the pastures. And as we rotate the cattle out of the paddocks, uh, the cows eat down the grass, eat the grass first, and then they kind of munch on the clover. We rotate them out, get a rain, and this clover regenerates itself. And just a fresh abundance of flowers again. And my bees come back to that site and just continually feed on this clover and this pasture as we rotate the cattle all the way through. It doesn't provide enough for a crop, but it provides enough nutrition for the bees to be able to maintain and develop themselves. Very important. Other things like we have all these little small dams projects on our, on our farm here just to hold some headwater back from uh, the spring melt so we don't wash out all Miami. We're right on top of the escarpment, 200 foot drop elevation. So we like to hold back the water just to help preserve our infrastructure below, right? So we have all these little small dams and it provides natural habitat. So we need more of that natural habitat across the countryside. We need to be able to preserve these wetlands. We need to hold back water in places and not just for the, um, the promotion of biodiversity, but we also need to be able to have places where the natural world can access water. Like animals need water to drink. It's very important. They got to access it from some, from somewhere. Honeybees drink a tremendous amount of water. So it's very important for me to have these little sources all over the place. So that's what we're doing as a farm. And that's just one small picture of it. Then we can get into pesticide management. We can get into crop rotation management and all these other dynamics that go on. I'm just focusing strictly on nutrition and some of these aspects that are involved with that within our farm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense though, right? It's just rule of thumb for biodiversity generally applies to this problem as well. So, you, you know, I think diversity is the key there for sure. Rob or Jason, uh, did you want to add to that at all? Maybe also look at the urban environment a little bit and maybe... Uh, sure of our listeners who are not on the farm? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, particularly with, you know, Be Better Manitoba, we're uh, all about uh, the urban environment in particular and uh, encouraging uh, suitable habitat for native bees. And I, I think the a couple of things that are, are fairly important there and also apply to, uh, you know, honeybees and agricultural landscapes is that you need, um, first of all, a succession of forage. So uh, you need, you know, forage going all the way through from early spring in April, all the way through out to the fall so that uh, social species that, that grow all year long, like bumblebees, some of the um, native bees that Jason works on, honeybees uh, need a succession of forage so they can continue. Uh, and uh, with some of the native bees, you know, they emerge at very specific times in the year. And as I was mentioning, is there a problem with synchrony? If they come out and their foraging uh, source isn't there for them, when they emerge, you know, they're obviously in trouble. So the succession of forage is important. And I think the other thing is the diversity of forage and, and you need um, for honeybee nutrition, for uh, the social insect species, you need that diverse pollen source that Ian was talking about uh, so that you get the correct mix of amino acids and proteins and lipids uh, to allow the, the bees to have their sort of optimal health so they can build up their fat bodies. They you know have to get through winter if there's a solitary bee or is a social bee with really good um, sort of reservoirs of, of uh, food stores and you need that diversity there uh, to provide the balanced diet that uh, is really uh, you know optimal for the bees um, and 
you need the diversity also to support things like Jason was talking about, where if you've got a willow bee, it needs willow. If you've got a sunflower bee, it needs sunflowers. So you need that diversity of sources as well uh, to provide the, the sort of unique uh, sources that are important for some species of bees that are specialists. So uh, I, I would probably highlight those uh, things in, in addition to what Ian has uh, already covered. I guess one question I, I'd like to get some feedback from Jason on, because I'm not sure about this, but you know, there are, there are purists that say you should only plant native pollinators. And we have this debate in our Bee Manitoba, uh, Bee Better Manitoba sort of site, um, only plant native pollinate, native plants to encourage native pollinators. But I kind of think that some of the, the non-native species are, are pretty good <laughs> and would help the, the native pollinators as well. And I'd sort of wonder uh, what, the, what the optimal strategy would be if you're trying to conserve um, you know, native pollinators should you just plant native plants or should you plant a mix of native plants and some of these other species that grow really well um, and provide lots of nectar and pollen in our kind of habitats? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I, and I am not a purist in the sense that, um, I, and I kind of follow, you know, Ian's sort of idea, you know, small things matter. You know, in an ideal world, yeah, I, I would, you know, promote, you know, reestablishing the prairies everywhere we can. Um, if, if, if the goal was to, protect, you know, preserve uh, wild bees. Uh, that's not always our goal. You know, we have other sort of desires. Um, and not everyone has the resources to do that. Native plants are probably the most expensive plants that you can buy. Um, you know, in an, ideally, you don't want to go to your local big box store to buy your plants. You want to go to a, a native plant nursery. But that's an expensive way to do it. Um, so any flower is better than no flower. Uh, and then native flowers are better than exotic flowers. That, that's that's kind of it's sort of a gradient. And so you can do whatever is within your power and your resources. You can, you know, and, and oftentimes it's, it's, it's low impact. It's actually not doing anything is, is sometimes the best thing you can do. So, you know, mow your lawn less, you know, don't spray herbicides on you know, let those grow. Uh, it's better to have dandelions for the bees than a, you know, an immaculate green lawn. Um, so I think I think there has to be a bit of a change in people's perspectives in terms of what they you know aesthetically find pleasing in sort of urban environments. Uh, you know, learning to appreciate sort of messy lawn uh, is actually a really good way to sort of you know protect that biodiversity, whether or not it's wild bees or any other sort of you know, beneficial sort of insect or, or bird or whatever it might be. Um, and when you start doing that, you start you, know, you start to appreciate all the amazing diversity that can sort of emerge in, a, in an urban setting. Um, yeah, I, I, and I, yeah, I, I could go on and on and on, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Rob, in, in the sense that um, any flower is better than no flower. Yeah, and you know, one of the takeaways I'm going to have, I'm going to remember, is Ian's uh, calendar with all the different things that you know, come come to exist, and some of them are fruits and, you know, things you recognize, trees, and then there's a dandelion month, and then, you know, there's alfalfa, and when you look at all that, you say, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have a succession of different things growing in my yard or in the environment we inhabit, right? Rural or urban, doesn't matter. So you, you have that diversity that supports insects and particular pollinators, so... Certainly something I'm going to take away. I'm going to look at my buffet a little differently for sure. I, I think we have some questions trickling in. And um, if I uh, could have uh, Crystal and Teddy maybe pull those up and we can go through some of those. And uh, let's start with the first one here. It says, in summertime, wasp tra traps are popular for patios. Do these pose harm to bees? And how would you mitigate that? So who wants to take that on Maybe Rob or Jason. Yeah, sure, I can do that one. I, I think, uh, generally speaking, the wasp traps aren't super harmful to bees. I think you need to be um, careful about what you're baiting them with, and uh, you know, make sure that it's not too high a concentration sugar um, solution. But uh, yeah. most of the wasp traps are present at a time uh, when the bees have sufficient forage around that they're not usually looking for uh sort of artificial sources um when there's a really good honey flow on bees will ignore <laughs> you could put a pail of syrup on a hive i think 
Ian can testify this and they will just ignore it. <laughs> if there's uh, nectar out there in the environment, they're going for it. Same with, with uh, pollen. If you've got natural pollen sources, you can, as a beekeeper, try and feed them a pollen patty or something like that. And they'll just go, no, no, <laughs> we'll, we'll take the good stuff. Uh, so with the, with the traps, lots of times they're uh, put out there at a time when uh, bees aren't really going to find them attractive. And, uh, you know, we've had traps out certainly in our yard in the city. And uh, uh, generally, if you're, you know, baiting them with, with something um, that's not too high a sugar concentration, uh, it's not usually going to be uh, highly attractive to honeybees. So I, I wouldn't be too concerned about trapping out honeybees if you have um, wasp traps that are currently registered. You have to be... Um, most there aren't really any uh insecticidal baited ones that are uh legal <laughs> in manitoba so that's not really a concern uh, that i would like to talk about but the uh you know if you in some countries where they do have uh certain compounds that they they put in there as baits uh those can be quite toxic to honeybees so you have to be very careful about the bait you choose if it was mixed with an insecticide just in case this is going out beyond the borders of manitoba uh you know if you're if you're using an insecticide baited wasp trap you need to be more careful okay excellent answer i'm going to move on to the next question then um this uh, is uh talking about a different jurisdiction it's kind of a really interesting question it's uh, it says on a visit to Billund, Denmark, I noticed that they promote urban beekeeping for backyards to promote pollination in the surrounding agricultural fields. So I guess it's an observation, but also a question uh, which follows, is this, there? Is, are there similar programs like that in Manitoba or in Canada you're aware of? Uh, I think um, generally that um, urban beekeeping, at least in in Manitoba is kind of probably more related to honey production. I can, I can tell you, <laughs> we were trying to look at um, the effect of putting um, honeybee colonies in different agricultural landscapes. So we're looking at putting them on soybean and looking at canola and trying to find sites where we could isolate our control sites so they would be away uh, from any potential exposure. And it's pretty hard to locate a colony in Winnipeg um, and not have it within range of a agricultural field. Um, we did find one location, I think, kind of tucked away, uh, way in the back of uh, Fort White Discovery Center. But um, if you draw a large circle around almost any area in, in the city, you're going to be uh, touching on agricultural landscapes. But I think uh, in terms of pollinating um, agricultural crops, normally um, in crops where they pay a fee, they put the bees right on the crop and try to match the timing of the, the movement of the bees um, into the crop so that uh, you get the optimal numbers of bees sort of on that crop. But um, there would be um, certainly bees that are going out into agricultural areas if you had them in the city, for sure. Um, I think it'd be better to put the bees out in the agricultural areas uh, to get the best pollination on those agricultural crops. Great. So this one goes to Ian. Uh, it's re regarding farmers and what do your fellow farmers think about your pollinator friendly practices? Yeah, that's an interesting question. When you have coffee with them, uh, do they make fun of you or do they actually appreciate what you're doing? Yeah, I appreciate that question because that's exactly the point. There's a rub. Uh, what I'm kind of saying is uh, we need to promote biodiversity and such, and farmers are very focused on eliminating that because profits, efficiencies, the bottom line, everything like that are farm too. And farmers are like this in a lot of ways. The blinders are up. They can't see anything other than what they're doing. I'd argue beekeepers are the same way too. We're, we've got our blinders up. We can't really see what the farmer is doing either. And I like to promote a discussion and dialogue like this just to help broaden the blinders like this a little bit just so we can see what's going on and if we can kind of see what's going on maybe we can understand why we need things to change and why we should try to achieve these objectives just to help everybody else and i like to uh, refer to a little bit of a story uh, there's a grain farmer out here twelve thousand acres big grain farmer he wanted a hobby 
so he's a neighbor of mine so he come over to me and he said Ian I want to buy some beehives my wife won't let me you know buy pigs or buy cows or whatever I gotta get something and I want some bees so I said that's fine here's four beehives so I gave him four beehives and he bothered me too much with you know guidance and mentorship and all this but he's a neighbor or whatever so I kind of helped him along and such and through harvest he sends me a text and he's like Ian Ian you know my bees are starving. I, I, I don't know what to do. He's on his combine. He's texting me. He says, I, I'm going to have to move these bees down to this organic field south of us, like 12 miles, just so I keep my bees alive. And I'm thinking to myself, I said, you, you're on a combine. You're combining, you know, I don't know how much production, very time sensitive job task at hand. And you're going to shut your combine down, piss your brothers off to move four <laughs> beehives down to an organic field just to keep your bees alive. And sure enough, he shut his combine down. He moved his four beehives down, put them on an organic farm where they had some diversity in flower and growth or weeds, like a farmer would say, and his hives thrived and he come back, started the combine. And so I asked him how things went, but that's exactly the point. He was able to see that his practices within his farm eliminated everything except for the crop that he's on and everything else around him was dying, including his bees that he's trying to care for. And just that very act helped him realize that maybe he should be putting a little bit of effort into preserving within the country, countryside so uh, you know i don't know but it, he's very conscious of the way he sprays it was very important like we can spray our fields which can mitigate some of these risks that are associated to death of honeybees and native pollinators use different products uh just different you know management practices just to help that provide you know that corner that he's farming that he never gets anything off of he's just gonna let it flower now into some kind of a natural growth which normally would have driven them crazy but all those weeds you know are providing nourishment for his bees so just little things like that and just widening the uh, the blinders just a little bit helped him realize what's going on and i think that's the old school of farming maybe is passing and we're seeing a, a younger i shouldn't say younger but more of a progressive generation coming in maybe realizing what we're doing and wanting to achieve these objectives and actually maybe putting some effort in trying to achieve them. So it's, it's an impossible balance. Like our farm, we haven't achieved that balance ourselves and we have a lot of conflict like this, but even if we just come a little bit closer, that's, you know, that's one good positive step forward to be able to achieve that balance is bring things a little bit closer and maybe ultimately we can allow technologies to help us further down the line to help us solve some of these issues, you know, but we can't solve them unless we identify them. And if I mean, we got to be able to acknowledge them before we're going to put any effort to solve them. So that's, that's, I thought that was a little interesting story I'd like to share. Yeah, that's an excellent story. What it really tells me is you got to give up more of your hives to other people. So they <laughs> oh, your it's a you, terrible amount of work to mentorship a, a grain farmer, I tell you. But, you know, loving the craft, you just like seeing your hives thrive with a neighbor who's actually oh, yeah. interested. So, and I actually have uh, 100 colonies. They, they were asking me to bring, a uh, beehives onto their property to pollinate their fields and i think that's very positive anybody asks me to bring bees i bring bees like that in an instant because i know they appreciate those pollinators i'll bring it to them and if they're thinking about the bees and they see me you know every two weeks or whatever and they see the hives working the collection of the honey then all their practices they'll have me in the back of their mind before they make some of these decisions and that's very important yeah once you have your own bees i think you change your mind jason you wanted to jump in go ahead well, yeah, I actually wanted to tie a little bit of what Ian said to the previous question as well. Um, it, it, when people are sort of considering this idea of sort of urban beekeeping, I think, that, I think I think Ian's kind of alluded to a point where you have to be really conscious of the fact that you have to be able to keep these things alive. Um, and it's not always challenging. Not everyone has an Ian Stepler um, that they can go to uh, for assistance. So... Um, you know, in, in Denmark, honeybees are a native species, but that's not true here. They're exotic. Um, and, you know, they have all these sort of uh, varroa mites and nutrition problems. Nutrition problems are probably less problematic in a city, but, you know, that you know they're facing all these sort of challenges. And it takes, you know, you have to be, you have to devote a lot of time and effort and, and put in a lot of, you know, think about it really intensely to make, make sure those bees stay alive. Because otherwise you're potentially doing more harm than good. Uh, don't want things to be sort of reservoirs for these sort of pests. Um, so it's just something to consider if people are sort of thinking about this and thinking about urban beekeeping, that it, it's not something that you can sort of just kind of put them out there and they'll take care of themselves. They're, they're not going to thrive 
on the road. Yeah, would, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I would echo Jason's comments, and particularly, I was always uh, quite concerned that um, if people are getting into urban beekeeping or any kind of beekeeping, that they you know, make sure that they're maintaining healthy colonies, because um, you know the past pests and pathogens that you'll find inside colonies can. Uh, you know, spread to other honeybee colonies, which is obviously a concern for uh, the industry and things like that. But uh, there is also potential for pathogen spillover so that, uh, you know, if you've got lots of virus or lots of disease inside a colony, it could be uh, affecting some of the native bees in the area. So, um, you know, I would encourage anybody that's um, considering keeping bees to make sure that they're really up on uh, the husbandry that's required uh, so that uh, they're maintaining uh, healthy colonies because you don't want to be in a situation where you might be negatively impacting any other uh, species of bees out there by you know being a bad beekeeper right. yeah, i gotta take of your own uh, take care of your own that's for sure uh, there's a question here that um two actually that are somewhat related and we addressed them a little bit but we talked about climate change and particularly this year with having lots of uh, water on the landscape and flooding so uh, the question is, uh, well, one is climate change. How does it affect pollinators? But Mar uh, Barb asks here that, uh, you know, several of these species that Jason mentioned are a nest on the ground. With all the rain and flooding this year, should we expect less bee species, for example, bumblebees? Jason, did you want to uh, address that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can touch on both of those, I, I suppose. But uh, I'm mostly sort of... Take a, a certain amount of solace in the fact that the bees, the native bees, that have been there for plenty of you know, millions of years, you know, they've seen everything. Um, you know, they've seen flooding whenever there wasn't, you know, dikes protecting the Winnipeg. Um, and so I think they're relatively well adapted to a lot of different sort of scenarios. Um, they might get sort of, you know, hit back, but they can they can recover. Uh, assuming that you know the resources are available in subsequent years, um, but I think what's problematic from a climate perspective is that you know, the prediction that these things are going to come more often, more frequently, we get these extended droughts, the weird winters will become a norm rather than an extreme, and that might cause some trouble for bees. Uh, one of the concerns uh, in a study that I was involved in years ago with, with apple pollination was that uh, you can People have demonstrated that you know uh, apples bloom you know weeks earlier now than they did you know, when people started recording bloom time, um, and that kind of causes concerns about this sort of phenological mismatch where the bees and the plants that they're specializing on no longer sort of fit uh, with climate. And some people have found that to be the case that sometimes you get these sort of mismatches occur. Our study sort of suggested within the apple case that if you had enough diversity of bees, that you would maintain that sort of pollination level. Yeah. But you know, if, if the numbers of bee species declined, then you no longer have enough overlap between the pollinators. And the plant. So there's, you know, climate is definitely, I suspect, is going to overtake habitat, you know, loss as sort of a primary driver of wild bee problems going forward. Right, so and then we can expect more climate variability, right, and extreme conditions, whether that's heat or moisture or lack of moisture. Uh, one thing that came to my mind is is heat generally. Like we had that massive heat wave just a couple of days ago, and we got to 38 degrees, in, you know, in the middle of Winnipeg. I think it, we broke a record by four degrees Celsius, something like that. Is is that a factor on bees or on insects generally? And and uh, is it the duration of the heat that matters or the fact that you reach a certain threshold? I think the, the bees are pretty well adapted to uh, deal with that kind of temperature. It could cause um, issues with swarming and things like that. The bees become more congested. They sometimes drape outside the colony. So it's, it's not uh, necessarily uh, great for a colony uh, if you're trying to produce lots of honey and manage it. But in terms of survival, uh, bees will collect lots of water, as Ian mentioned earlier, and they collect quite a bit, uh, and they bring it back to the hive, and they were one of the first uh, to invent uh, air conditioning, and they'll, they'll bring the water back to the hive, and they'll actually evaporate it uh, to cool down the, the nest, uh, the bee nest, and 
uh, maintain a constant temperature. So um, they have a, a capacity to deal with those heat uh, conditions. When you get into uh, countries like India, where you know you'll often get plus 40 temperatures, uh, bees can survive even under those conditions. So I think they're they're pretty well adapted, but it means they're shifting a lot of energy away from uh, what they should be doing, <laughs> you know, collecting pollen, collecting nectar, building up their brood nest, tending the brood, feeding the, the larvae inside the hive to uh, collecting water and, and air conditioning. So it, it definitely sets them back a bit, but it's usually not fatal. Okay. Uh, I always That's attribute uh, hot weather to honey making weather. Uh, we, we don't make honey unless we actually have warmth. I mean, we can get to 40 degrees, which is pushing the limits, and we're not going to be making much honey on that. But, you know, that 28 to 30 degrees is just perfect for, for these bees to bring in. It, it, they work such long days because it's such, they, you know, the warmth is there. And I, I hire a lot of school kids, and they come onto the farm, they work for me, and it's just deadly hot. These bee yards are in the calm spots and the sun's bearing down on them. They're carrying these heavy boxes of honey and they're being stung and, and it's just deadly some days. And I bump into them uh, years after and they talk to me about uh, the bee working weather. They talk to me about, you know, this is, this is bee heat <laughs> working in the heat, you know, honey producing weather. So they're hard working. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, guys. I mean, I could speak uh, for, uh, you know, for much longer about this topic. It's fascinating stuff. But uh, I do have to cut it off at this point. I want to thank our presenters, Rob, Jason, and Ian, for joining uh, me today. I think this was a great discussion, and I certainly uh, learned lots. And we very much appreciate your time and uh, effort for joining us. And I do want to thank our audience as well they, uh, for submitting uh, questions and joining us today. And we will send out a quick uh, survey about our faculty conversation. And I hope you'll be able to respond and give us some feedback on how this went. And if uh, you want to see this again, starting up uh, this coming fall, I will circulate that survey on email, but also on our social media feeds. And you can also check those channels, uh, such as makemanitoba.ca, for uh, other event notices. And uh, if you don't already uh, receive our newsletter, the Ag E News. Uh, please email us at agfoodsci at umanitoba.ca to sign up. Okay, thank you everybody again for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day and a wonderful summer. <laughs>